Jonathan Brent, Executive Director of the Evo Institute, and it's a pleasure welcoming you to the second of our uh, events concerning uh, the Pink House of Mets. Uh, I want to thank our friends at the center, particularly uh, Judy Siegel, uh, for helping to arrange this. I want to thank Elena Gindi, our program director at EVO. And mainly, I want to thank our participants, uh, Magda Peter uh, from Wesleyan, and Jay Berkowitz from the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. Uh, this looks, it promises to be a most interesting evening, and with no further commentary, uh, I will let uh, Magda and Jay uh, proceed. I do have two or three uh, small um, uh, announcements. One is that uh, you can become a member of EVO, simply by filling this form out that you'll find at that back table. The other is that you can take courses at EVO uh, in what is uh, quickly becoming a, a most popular and actually somewhat acclaimed uh, program on Ashkenazi civilization, and Magda Teeter will be teaching. A, uh, a course uh, on history, memory, on nostalgia of Polish Jews in film. Uh, uh, Kurt Levin is teaching, Sam Kassau, Gennady Estreich, Adam Kirsch, Dmitry Slepovich, and I too will be teaching a course on Shlom Leicham. Um, I also invite all of you to consider coming to EVO's 88th Annual Benefit, Tuesday, November 19th, at, um, uh, well, I guess it's 7 o'clock. Anyway, uh, there is literature on the back table. Please be sure to check it out. Thank you. It's 
an interesting story. Uh, I saw the Pinkas for the first time on microfilm in the basement of the National Library in Jerusalem, where the Institute for Microfilm and Hebrew Manuscripts uh, is located. Uh, a, a late colleague, Professor Israel Tashma, had recommended that I have a look at it. I spent about uh, 10 minutes with the document on the screen, decided it was too difficult to read, uh, too boring because it was all about credit and debt, and I filed it away in my memory as something that uh, I probably would never look at again. And then, it's in Hebrew, uh, it's, it's handwritten, and uh, at the time it looked like scribbling more than anything, anything else. About uh, 10 years later, 10, 12 years later, I met uh, a mutual friend, a friend of a friend, who uh, in Jerusalem, who is a private researcher, bibliographer, and he was looking for some work, and he asked me, don't I have a project that I've always wanted to work on, but didn't have the time, perhaps he could help me. So I figured the best way to get rid of this guy <laughs> is to let him have a look at, or tell him about the Pinkas of Mets, because he would have the same view as me, but it was just too difficult. He said, let's have a look. We had a look for about 20 minutes, reached the conclusion that there was something much more important than I first realized, and we decided that we would devote some more time, maybe a summer, to really investigating what was there. And in the course of the summer, we transcribed a number of cases from the manuscript in Hebrew. I, from the microfilm. From the microfilm. There's nothing like a microfilm. From the microfilm, and then on the basis of that, um, I wrote a grant proposal and got me some money to have a more serious transcription done. And then, some years later, I came to New York to see the original, and then I started working on a daily basis when I had a, a, a fellowship here at the Center for Jewish History, National Endowment for Humanities Fellowship, that enabled me to work closely with the manuscript, and uh, here we are, we're publishing the entirety of the, of the Pinkas, annotated, 900 pages worth of uh, Hebrew documents, and with that, uh, uh, a companion volume of 200 pages monograph in English on the cases, the history of the court, and uh, how it interacted with French civil law. And that will be an incredible contribution to uh, scholarship and Jewish history. So why don't we take a look at some of the yeah. examples uh, of uh, um, he said he can't see the original in New York. Where is that? The, the, the original is upstairs. And Actually, you can see it right. over there. And in one, one of the first volumes is actually on display uh, to my right, to your left, uh, which is the new rare book of Roman Center of Jewish History. And there is a wonderful exhibition called Circles of Justice uh, Jews, Culture, uh, and Mets. And in the 18th century, and it is uh, just a wonderful collection of uh, books, manuscripts, um, history, narrative, portraits, images, something that I think is uh, extraordinary and really brings to life many of the ideas that we'll be talking about tonight. So, um, as court records go, there are some boring cases and there are some really exciting cases, and I think we have before us a couple of those examples of the uh, of the, the exciting ones. Um, so the, the first two cases, as I said, uh, concern uh, um, a pregnancy out of wedlock. And um, the first one is about the domestic servant Kenny, or Kenny, right? She, she appears in different names, who, and if you have the, the text before us, approached the Beit Dean, the rabbinic court, with the complaint that she was seduced by the domestic servant Lazi, uh, or Lazi, who is currently working for Katin Wolf, uh, Shari, Shari. Shari, Shari. And so she said, I'm pregnant by him because he had sex with me twice in the kitchen of my master, Katin Wolf, Shari. Shari. How did you, why did you pick this case? Surely for shock value. No, this, I think this case, there's a wonderful, first of all, there are about 30 such cases in the Pinkas, 30 paternity cases. In 20 years. In 20 years, but many more are bunched up in about 10 years. Now, so that would mean three a year. Some of them are happening two a month, so it gives an idea that 
How big was the Jewish community? The community was 3,000 Jews at the time. So uh, I'm not sure what the statistical significance of this is. One has to do some thinking about that. But the fact that it represents in the totality 3% of the cases that came before the Beit Din, there were roughly 1,000 cases before the Beit Din, 30 of them are paternity cases, gives us some sense. I don't mean to suggest that, that the community would have completely overrun boundaries of uh, promiscuity, but at the same time, what we have is a window into real life. And the real life of the Jews is uh, something that we should pay more attention to. Now, uh, this case offers us such entree into real life. At the same time, uh, what intrigues me about the case is the fact that in some ways this is a he said, she said kind of uh, discourse. And it's interesting to me, and I hope to you also, to have a look at how the court finds its way through the entanglements of truth being stated on either side. Right, it's a very, it's a, a very, yeah. Uh, Ray would be honest. Uh, what is seduction in uh, Peter? Uh, Peter Tuck, okay. if I talk, but just to seduce. But, and and that, that's not an irrelevant uh, uh, distinction, actually, in this case. Um, I don't believe that the word rape is generally used in these cases. But uh, unwanted sexual advance, depending on how one, one wants to understand it, is uh, potentially. Yeah. Okay. It's well, she had no choice. She has a choice. Well, that, indeed, uh, I think that there's a that, that, that's relevant to how the court will think about this. But we'll move we'll on. And uh, I think that the case is very interesting because it does, as you say, preserve some voices: uh, the, the woman's voice, the uh, men involved in different ways, whether the ones who are implicated in the case or witnesses, um, and um, there is a lot, I think, that the case raises, both from a legal point, and we'll get to it in, in a moment, but also culturally, about sexuality, the sexual um, life of, of, of Jews at the time. The, uh, the question of privacy, uh, and the places people were believed or considered having sex, um, uh, the question of what was seen, what was not seen, the question of what was heard. So there is a whole sort of vibrancy. If we could imagine making a film about it, and there would be a lot of sort of interesting dynamic, uh, dynamic uh, scenes. And you're right, they, it's he says, she says, um, and so I wonder whether we could maybe take a look at some of those, uh, those. Uh, so, so the, the public can get a sense of what's So she comes to the court. Why does she come to the court? Why would she approach the court herself? So typically, women who were in this situation that is pregnant uh, with a claim of uh, paternity against uh, a, a man uh, would be looking for financial support and quite regularly also uh, have a marriage. As in the second case? Yeah. Yes. Uh, now, that's not explicitly stated in this case. That's right. the, second yeah. case. the second case does, and sometimes one has to read the cases together in order to get the full sense of what's going on. On the other hand, the fact that it's not mentioned is, I think, significant. Uh, what exactly is she looking for, and why does she come to court? So I'm not sure we can provide an easy answer to that just yet. Let's perhaps, should, should we perhaps follow the narrative of the case a little bit and get a sense as to how it plays itself out? Mm -hmm. uh, do you want to? Sure. So, so she comes to the court and, uh, and and stated that as she as we said that she was pregnant. So the court investigates the matter, questions her to determine uh, the time that he, she allegedly had uh, intercourse with the, the man she is accusing, and she doesn't remember quite well. She first says uh, it was around before Hanukkah, uh, and then the second time two weeks later, and then she changes the story. She talks about maybe it was before Sukkot, so she she has she doesn't remember, which then undermines her whole yes. testimony and her case. 
So the court calls the, uh, uh, the man whom she is implicating to, uh, to, uh, to testify, and he, as might be expected, said that he had, uh, he had never had anything to do with her, that he never touched her, even with his little finger. And that's a phrase that comes back uh, in these. Is that a formulaic phrase? I think, I think it is formulaic. Uh, it's uh, just the idiomatic uh, expression of never having had any contact whatsoever. And uh, and then, but she stands by her testimony. She said, no, no, no. Okay, yes, you in this court. This is obviously a summary. She, he 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 did that. And then they sent for a uh, man mayor, Moshe's servant, to testify whether he saw he saw what happened. So again, this is what is interesting about the seeing, the expectation that this may have been seen. So the question of sort of oh, public knowledge, privacy, could you maybe... I think we might add to that, that both she and this other servant may here are each servants in the same house. Mm -hmm. They're both servants to the master Moshe Shari. Mm -hmm. So it stands to reason that if anybody saw anything, it would have been Mayer. So he was a likely candidate to come in and spill the beans if there was... Especially if it was in the kitchen. <laughs> I should say. Right. So, um, but he complicates the, the matter, right? Because he says that, no, he didn't see anything, but uh, that he heard her admit in his presence that she had become pregnant by the son of, of their master, to which she then said, no, it was a lie. So again, he added a little bit of, uh, of detail of what may have, uh, what may have happened. And then um, he is questioned thoroughly whether, again, he saw any intimacy, and he said that he did not. And then they sent for um, another, oh, he, he asked somebody to, uh, to overhear, right? To spy on the yes, girl. Uh, this is the second potential witness who's brought into the case, mm -hmm. who evidently has some uh, knowledge of what may have happened. And uh, Mayor, I guess, had a plan that was to uh, try and find out uh, what, well, whether uh, the young woman could be tripped up, perhaps, by making private, private remarks to him mayor and someone who were here and then could report that to the court. And it's a very curious thing what happens here, what is reported to the court. Maybe we should take a look at that passage and yeah. read it. Right? This, is, this is page one, the second column. Oh. So to, uh, so mayor asked, uh, maybe, maybe we should back up a sentence, right? He responded that he did not see any intimacy between them and also Kaufman ben, ben en, not Cohen testified before the Beit Dean that when he was walking on the street along with the Moselle River, Mayer approached him and asked him to take the servant girl to her father in Busendorf. To this he replied that he did not want to do that, and afterwards the servant Mayer asked him to hide in the cow shed in, of his master in order to hear what she would say to the servant boy. For this, he, uh, he would give him a bottle of wine. And then what, uh, Jay, you want to pick it up? And then he agreed, it's and hid in the agreed. <coughs> hid in the coach, in the cow shed, translated that into contemporary uh, language of what would it be, maybe uh, hid in the car and then in the, uh, in the garage. <laughs> he heard how the servant girl said to the servant mayor, Es geht euch nichts ab. Was wollt ihr ich schon kennen zwei Leute dort mit Tor haben? I have to tell you, it took me about two years to figure out what that meant. Not because I don't know Yiddish that well, that's part of it, but it's because it doesn't correspond easily to anything that some of the most uh, senior experts in Yiddish around the world uh, have ever seen. And after consulting with uh, probably about six or seven of them on three or four different continents. Uh, this is what we came up with. It is none of your business 
what do you want that I should earn two Louis d'or? Louis d'or is a, is a coin. Honestly. That, that's no. a very curious phrase that was taken out and recorded in the court records. Yes. What do you make of it? So I, I think it's, first of all, we have to ask what language uh, is the, are the court proceedings generally? They're in Hebrew. And that's a classically uh, uh, traditional uh, language for legal material court records, and it's not so surprising. We assume that the proceedings themselves, that is the litigation, the arguments, the comments of the, of the questions of the, of the judges of the Beitim, are all in Yiddish. Okay? But they're transcribed in Hebrew. And then every so often, we have these little snippets of comments that are preserved in their original Yiddish or Judeo Alsatian, is perhaps a better term, uh, just as they were pronounced in that court. This is the closest thing we have to a tape recorder going at the time. This preserves in the clearest form right, exactly what she said and how she meant what she said. So what I've noticed is that the recording of these Yiddish sentences or phrases tends to be more prominent in the sex cases, in the cases concerning paternity, than in other cases. And perhaps it's because it's in these cases in particular that we need to have exactly an idea of what it is that was said. Because after all, in this case, like no other case, everything will hinge on just exactly what was meant and how it was said. But presumably, they, I mean, there are two uh, instances where there are actual quotes, right? In this case, the very first yes. one, and then here. And we assume that there was more said yes. in this case. Uh, the rest is uh, summarized. Why this particular sentence was picked by the court? Taking into consideration that this is a court record, why would they pick this particular sentence for this case? What did it serve the court to include that sentence? First of all, I think it, 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 it establishes a certain credibility on the part of this, this other fellow Kaufman who overheard what she had said. So this is the closest thing we have to uh, uh, actually being there. Second, she has, through the use of the idiomatic expression, in, in particular the last part, Vitoar uh, Abin, she I think has allowed us to penetrate uh, more deeply into precisely what she means, because no one could have made this up think so easily. This is a uh, this is a case where I think this is an instance where the quote secures in some fundamental sense the credibility of the witness. Okay. So what is meant by it? Can yes. you explain? Sure, I'll try to explain yes. it. So to us. obviously it seems that there was a misunderstanding or a disagreement between Mayor, uh, her fellow a servant in the house of Moshe Shari and herself. And this is an answer of hers to his apparent uh, questioning or admonition of her, why are you starting out with the master's son? Now, how do I know that? So let's, let's work with that assumption. Why are you starting out with the master's son? She answers, it's none of your business. What do you want? that I should earn to Louis Dora honestly, that is, that I should work for a living, I can make some money, or I suppose the word might even be gold digger, I might be able to establish for myself greater economic stability if I can successfully land a relationship, ultimately a marital relationship, with my master's son. Because after all, that's the ticket to financial success. She's not going to be able to achieve that sort of financial uh, uh, stature, that economic success, continuing to work as a domestic servant, because the money can't be very good, and one can't imagine that she's going to go very far. But she can go far 
if she can marry the minister's son. So I think that she has, through this Yiddish quote, as represented by this other fellow Kaufman, has really indicted herself in a way that, or I should say, has undermined her uh, original testimony, which uh, was based on an accusation of that other fellow, Lazi. But it's really his work, and it's the servant mayor who is accused. That's his strength, right? So. Okay, so we, it's not he, a perfect. Uh, he's not a perfect. Not perfect. But on the other hand, there's, there is a preservation in the idiom, I think, of something that, that allows us to consider this to be a valid uh, claim, I, without making it absolutely certain. Mm -hmm. okay. And then the, the court makes a decision. Um, would, would you comment on the decision of the, of the court um, before we go on? So, so they, they rule. Yeah, and, uh, where is it now? That's, they, uh, they rule that, at, that if the birth occurs yeah. between seven months and full term, then the servant Lazi uh, will be required to swear that he never had intercourse with her, and following mm -hmm. the oath, neither she nor the child will have any claim on him. But if she gives birth after Rosh Chodesh Elul, um, uh, or if she gives birth in less than seven months, then he will be exempt from the oath, and she will have no valid claim against him. Again, essentially she is the same. Here he, he will be let off free, as, except that once he will have to take an oath and she won't have to take, have any claims, and the other case would be she, he won't have to take an oath. So let me just go over it just yeah. a little bit more detail. So uh, what the court, the court is suggesting is that if the birth occurs during a time that is plausibly uh, related to his advances. In other, words, could, in other words, that the timing would be right, and that there's a plausibility factor here that could be invoked, that he could be responsible. Then in such an instance, he must take an oath indicating that he has no responsibility. Okay? With that oath, he can walk away. In other words, if the presumption is that a person in the 18th century, in a traditional Jewish community, would not take such an oath and perjure himself, lie, because the stakes are far too great, and the punishment for whatever it is that, or the responsibility that he, that he would have to undertake would be far less severe than the consequences of a false oath. The false oath would be punished in heaven, not just uh, economically. So and that's a shared assumption on, on courts on Jewish and non-Jewish courts. The oath is there in, in, in non-Jewish courts also. Now, is that equally valid today in the way that courts operate? Um, well, that's for a jury to decide, right? But uh, in this particular instance, uh, and there are legal consequences for perjury now, right? Yes. Yes. Yeah. yes. So I think that. Um, the plausibility of his advances having resulted in pregnancy within a particular time frame is what will establish his right to walk away if he uh, takes the oath, or not to have to take the oath at all if it's implausible. Mm -hmm. Okay. So then um, she's asked again to state truthfully the identity of the man with whom she had sex, and in presence of her father, who at this time appears, she states, and again, this brings back the point about privacy, she stated in the presence of her father, and this is now at the top of the second page, that the servant was with her on the first day of Sukkot at night in the room where the master sleeps, while all members of the household were awake. And then her father uh, inter intervenes, and then they, uh, and they, they conversation and then they talk about the number uh, of times that they they may have had sex and then afterwards we sent for Leib, son of Moshe, Shari, her master, and she stated before us that he had relations with her many times. So that's an, again that's sort of an interesting thing about the question of privacy, the expectation that it might be seen or the possibility that might be seen, and then of course then she, uh, she changes the story. Hey, hey, one comment on this. Yes. 
which is that I think that the first night of Sukkot is the perfect night to achieve uh, uh, some sort of uh, a secret liaison. After all, everybody's in the sukkah, and, and, uh, Away. The cup, and the couple is upstairs in the bedroom. So that uh, might be a more plausible uh, uh, way around an end run around the privacy issue. And um, why would she have changed the testimony in the end? Because she changes the testimony and then she um, admits uh, that my master Moshe did not seduce me and then she was asked whether this master's son did anything with her and then that's when she admits that, uh, that her master said it before and that she, he had relations with her many times. And then, uh, why would she, what do you think has happened with I that? Think, I think the weight, the, weight, the weight of uh, evidence in, court in, the, in this case has begun to shift, and I think that she's aware of it. This is sort of a, a TV show, you know, where you're, you're watching it, and then at some point about 35 or 40 minutes into the hour program, uh, you begin to notice that the, the, uh, the person who committed the crime, who has hidden the crime until now, is beginning to note that that uh, it cannot be concealed any longer. Uh, the, uh, the statement by Kaufman about what she had said mm -hmm. privately to Mayer is one thing. It seems that some of the concerns that were expressed about her changing the story are another. Uh, now this comment that her father makes, I think it's about five lines down on top of the page, uh, two, her father mm -hmm. said to her, I was told how you learned what needed to be said about the servant boy. In other words, he's, he's implying in the court that she's been somehow trained or trained herself to lie in order to get the results that she wanted. Well, I think that all of this in the aggregate is beginning to come down very heavily on her and she's now going to offer perhaps a different solution to uh, how she got pregnant. Mm -hmm. But there's a problem with that. And what's that? Even if she can now make the claim that it was the servant's, excuse me, it was the master's son, Leib, whom she says she had relations with many times, the legal question is, can she at this point point an accusing finger at somebody else uh, now that the first fellow has been exonerated? And, uh, any lawyers in the, in the audience who uh, might be able to help us out with this? What uh, we have uh, we have two potential uh, responsible parties here. One is the servant boy, and the other is the master's son. And when you let one off the hook, does that automatically result in the uh, uh, indictment of the other? No, no. And it seems that it's because having perjured herself. She has completely diminished her own credibility, her own trustworthiness, so that to make the accusation against this other fellow, even though he might well have been uh, the responsible uh, party, the father of the child, uh, it won't stand up in court. She has, in some sense really, uh, undermined her position in its entirety, simply because now no one will have to take responsibility. And that's a serious matter, as we'll, we'll see very shortly. Yes? Um, I also uh, think that the fact that the father, the father now also didn't believe her, didn't, didn't help her credibility either. Yes. Mm -hmm. And it sounded like what had happened, I don't know, uh, <laughs> the case that uh, uh, she was trying to get the, the, uh, the son to marry her, it didn't work. And so they concoct the story well, and they better blame somebody else. And I guess among the three of them, maybe the master too, they figure out how we can escape those years and years. And the father knew that. You know, you were rehearsed to say that. Mm -hmm. But the whole case. Everything has just fallen apart at this point. And, and the case really ends with the question of acquittal of the man and letting them. She she asks forgiveness, but the question of her social standing, legal standing, kind of disappears. Do we do we know um, what may have happened to her in this situation? Would she have stayed in the community? 
uh, what do you imagine? I assume we have to use historical imagination here, or unless we have other uh, external evidence, what may have happened? So first of all, the, the somewhat uh, difficult aspect of these court records is we frequently do not know how the story ends. Uh, I've searched uh, the names and the remainder of the court records and nothing else shows up. So we don't know exactly how it turned out beyond what we have here. So using one's imagination, using my imagination anyway, uh, we can assume that she would try to find someone else to marry as quickly as possible. Now that's because to be a single mother in, a, in 1774 or, or 84 is not a pretty picture. And secondly, there are other disincentives to remaining in that state. First of all, a child born out of wedlock, according to the royal law, is susceptible to, to be taken by the king and raised as a Catholic. In other words, it's not just a matter of uh, uh, a stigma, but there may actually be a legal dimension to this that places the child at some risk. And therefore, uh, one would want to find a way to place that child within a Jewish family and I don't know that adoption is the is the uh, the way the way to achieve that in the 1780s. That's but right. The the, the law that uh, Jay Berkowitz is uh, discussing is in French, and it says that all infants born out of wedlock must be brought up in Catholic religion because he belongs to the sovereign, and therefore to the Catholic religion. So that's the that's the uh, on page three. law on the page three, and this. Uh, law, as well as the next case, uh, for me, um, raise a historical question of why would such law be issued? Is that a social problem that there are these out of wedlock Jewish children, whether in Alsace or, or elsewhere? What would have prompted in 1785 a royal decree of that kind? Okay. I'm going to take that question in a second. Uh, do you have something? The question is, were there any civil records available at that time in the 1780s regarding who was born or not? Because I know it very depends on Europe where the records were taken of people who were born for marriages. You know, they had to be registered even if they were done in the So we have registration of births. That's, that's, a, that's a requirement of French law that all births have to be uh, registered with the civil authorities. So there's no way around the, the knowledge that this child is, is, is born, will be born, and that there could be consequences as a result. Now, uh, there are a couple of questions on the table here that I'd like to address. Uh, and first of all, I think that one has to ask the question whether this royal law which actually originates in 1682, and now it's being renewed in 1767. Uh, that's, that's a good chunk of time. It's over, it's over 80 years uh, since its original enactment. Uh, the fact that it's being renewed in 1767 suggests that perhaps it has not been such a successful law. Laws that are successful don't need to be repeated. Uh, laws that are unsuccessful need to be said over and over again. So uh, that's, there is that possibility. Right, and the question of success could be either um, that, uh, in fact, the children out of wedlock were taken out and, uh, and baptized, or it could be successful that there were no children or very few children out of wedlock, and then suddenly in the 1760s that becomes a, a problem, which, um, which comes up a little bit, and I'm not suggesting that it does become a problem of that kind, but in the, in the second case that we have, um, there is this typical for every generation concern that the new generation, young generation, becomes more less uh, uh, moral and much more correct or uh, licentiousness and all the living wantonly. And I think we can, we can see it in every generation. 
So that can be taken with a grain of salt. Uh, but um, but that royal law and and some of the uh, the comments here, especially in the second case, where it only ends up in the court because of pregnancy. It's not about sex. It's about the pregnancy. It's not. It's not a criminal offense. It's a civil. Right. It's a civil matter. That's right. And I think that's important. Uh, at the same time, we do know that out of out of uh, out of wedlock, uh, children children born in France is probably a higher number, percentage-wise, than any other country in the 18th century. That's a it's a phenomenon that is not peculiar to France, but it seems to be more uh, prominent there than elsewhere. So one could call it something of a social problem. Uh, there is at the same time this presumption that the king is the sort of the father of all, all, all is the ultimate father of all children of all families, uh, and therefore taking in such a child is uh, consistent with this sort of image of the king. The fact that the king is Catholic uh, would suggest then that uh, that that this child is. Uh, a wayward child and must be brought up in the proper religion. But I think that... Especially in France. Yeah, they were about certainly, in yeah. a Catholic country. But I think that uh, what I've been able to discern from, from the way these cases play themselves out, and I'm thinking not just about the cases here, but perhaps the other 28 or so that, that are recorded and baked in, is that the very fact that the baked in does not require the putative father to marry uh, the girl, unless there is absolute evidence, but not that they get married even before the child is born. Whereas according to the law, if they don't do that, then the child can be taken away and be, be baptized, would suggest to me that this law that uh, is now being renewed in 1767 is uh, one that evidently fell into disuetude. In other words, it's, not, it's no longer being enforced. And perhaps it was never really enforced the way that the king had intended. And because if it were, then the baby, one could bet that the Bay Dean would want to see every unwed mother married as quickly as possible to preclude and forestall the removal of children in the Jewish community. And the fact that they want to make sure that there is an obedience to halakha, to Jewish law in this case, because one does not permit a man who is not the father of that, that, that child to marry uh, the woman until 90 days after the birth. That's, that's the general Jewish law. If the law, the king, had actually been enforced, then one could imagine that in those 90 days, the child could be taken away and baptized. So I think that's the clearest proof that it's just not happening. Now, this is a very good example of what we'll call prescriptive law versus what's actually going on in practice. This is the law as it's recorded. This is the law as it perhaps was intended. One would have to go the, 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 royal, the royal, royal law, but one would have to go to the to the court records of the civil courts in France and see whether there is an enforcement of this law. Is uh, yeah, and Catholic baptismal records in that. Ah, there you go. And I haven't even haven't gone to those, and I haven't thought about that. But, but I mean, the church would have have kept a very detailed. Uh, record of children baptized, and they would usually, I mean, I don't know French records, but I know Polish records, mm -hmm. and I know Italian records, and they would usually know that this would have been a child, a Jewish child uh, baptized, or take that would have been, yeah. uh, That's a great idea, and uh, you know, it's funny, one can look at these records for years and years, and uh, it's only recently, fairly recently, that I began to notice this particular aspect of the issue, that is that there's a wrong law, and that the law is, uh, is not uh, particularly beneficial to the Jews, and Jews have to be careful about that, and uh, how does one measure the degree to which the law is real and not just uh, uh, in theory, and here I am, sitting with my colleague, uh, who's a specialist in uh, uh, Polish Jewish history and uh, Catholic records, and, uh, and I, I've been reminded, as, as so often happens, that these documents have to be read in tandem with a whole set of other documents in order for us to fully appreciate the degree to which Jewish history interfaces with general history. 
And I think that's a, a, I want to go to the second case because it's interesting for many yeah, reasons. But it, 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 let me just make this point quickly. Um, that uh, it would have fascinating to me looking at these cases that if you, you really need to, not you, but we historians need to look at these uh, sources and the multiplicity of the, the sources. So if you only look at these Jewish uh, sources, you see that there was promiscuity, sexual relations out of wedlock within the Jewish community and it created some sort of a social problem. When you look at only Christian records, then you see that there was a lot of sexual relations going on between Jewish men and Christian women, and, uh, and that created a social problem. And in fact, you know, the first case uh, about the servant woman with the, the son of the servant uh, of the master, not unusual for, for uh, any society. And the cases that I've seen in Polish court records, it would have been a, a Christian servant woman having sex with a Jewish boy. And then things would get out of hand and they would end up being uh, in court. The only problem is that sexual relations between Jews and Christians in Poland at least were punishable by death uh, because it was considered adul adultery. So this is a little less serious, but nonetheless it's an interesting to keep in mind how if we look only at one type of sources, we only see one side of story. I'm sorry, there's a question here. Yeah. So, let me ask the question. It's uh, the death being determined not that she cannot be believed. So why bring in the entire question of whether the child is taken by the king or not taken by the king, you're dealing with the records of the vet, the court of vets, they made the decision. What bearing does all this question of, uh, of, uh, of the uh, taking the child for the king? Uh, I think it goes like this. The law of the land to which Jews are subject is that out of wedlock children are at risk and that uh, ordinarily we would expect that if children are at risk and could be taken away and baptized, that the community and its institutions would do everything they could to forestall that eventuality. So it seems to me that although that particular issue does not come up in the case, it has to, it's, the, it's the backdrop. And knowing, that, knowing about the law and the fact that uh, there was some concern around the question of the application of this law uh, and the enforcement of this law, one has to uh, make some determination as to how the Beit Din comported itself on such matters. And I think that what, what, what I would add, which might help perhaps to explain the matter a little bit more, is that if you look at the bottom of page three on the left-hand side, one sees that the issue of this law actually surfaces in the responsa literature in Metz uh, shortly before this episode takes place. In fact, we'll just, I'll just read a couple of sentences. This is a case brought before Rabbi Gershon Koblenz, who had been, by the way, a justice on the uh, Beit Din some years before this. An unmarried woman became pregnant and claimed that a certain man was responsible he denied the charge, refusing responsibility for her and the baby. Sounds familiar. And the royal decree is that as long as she is not married to a man who confirms the child issued from him, the child shall be taken by the king. The question is whether one whom we know did not touch her, that is, who absolutely had no responsibility in her pregnancy, that is, who was not in the city, with her, can he marry her simply in order to save the child? So the very fact that it's, it's being discussed in the response of literature at that time uh, is, again, part of the information that uh, is relevant to the reading of the court. Does it have to be uh, to the exact meaning of the court? Well, I would put it this way. The very fact that the baked-in rules, as it does, tells us 
that in all likelihood this royal law was not being enforced. Because if it were being enforced, the Beit Din would have probably been quicker to find someone responsible, no matter what, to save that child. What is interesting about these uh, cases, and I do want to get to the second one in, in a second, is that um, in none of them, the, the issue of honor of the woman is articulated. And in cases, uh, in Christian cases, um, in Europe, uh, related to out of wedlock pregnancy, this is usually the, the issue of, uh, of her honor. And when she calls, she doesn't want to get married in these Christian cases, as especially is the, the case in the second one here. Um, but there is, it's always framed in the context of honor. And here this is missing, even though these are also legal cases. So I wonder whether you could maybe comment a little bit about that because I think it might uh, bring us closer to discussing the type of court this was, Jewish, Jewish courts were. Okay, so I, I think very briefly I'll say that what appears to be the case here is that this is a court that deals with civil matters, that is with monetary claims. It's not about passing moral judgment per se on uh, perpetrators of a, uh, an act that otherwise might be considered uh, unacceptable in the moral sense. It's not making moral judgment about uh, children born out of wedlock, but rather trying to simply uh, deal with the issue from the standpoint of uh, if there is responsibility, who's going to pay? Mm -hmm. and who's going to assume that responsibility? And I think that uh, the very fact that it doesn't go any further than that, as you say, it doesn't really take up the question of honor, is a rather clear proof that this, this court, this rabbinic court, has delimited its, or bounded its, uh, its action and, 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 the, and, the, and the purview of its authority to uh, just the, the civil uh, dimension. The second case, I think, is a is a might partially explain that. But go ahead, Jay. No, I, 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 I'd like to go forward with the other case. I'm keep, keeping that question in mind because because I do believe that there's something to what you say, and I think that uh, the the general uh, disfavor that might have existed in the way that servant girls or boys were viewed by the community leadership may not have been shared quite to the same degree in the court as it was in the communal leadership for reasons that have to do with politics as compared to law. I mean, the law doesn't have a political dimension, but it, there may be a, a differentiation here, distinction we can draw between the two. Let's go to the next case and then perhaps we'll see more. Yeah, the next case is a little clearer, that is, uh, there's much less, and there's a little bit she says, he says, but the case is resolved in a clear way, but it is, so for that reason, somewhat different, but it's also interesting because the um, young woman has a representation. So the young woman, uh, Reich Fishman uh, Fishman Cohen, came before the leaders of the community in the communal meeting room with a general... Where are you already? Oh, uh, I'm starting to read the second case. Page two. 450. Yeah, number 450. 450. That's right, that's right. So... Uh, On Wednesday, that's right. That's right. So, uh, so the, the, uh, the, the Lazar Ben, ben Nathan Cohen, attorney for the young woman, Rachel Beth Fisman Cohen, came before the leaders of the community in the communal meeting room with a great complaint to Sue Hertz uh, Ben Neta as, as follows. Seeing that Hertz had intercourse with the aforementioned maiden and she had become pregnant out of wedlock, and it is by the young man, she there, therefore demands that he take her as his wife 
and pay her all the expenses that ensue from this and maintain the child as, a, as is customary. Before we go on, what is interesting are two things. A, Reife has representation, has an attorney, and B, they approach the community leaders, the Kahal, not the Bedin. Would you comment on why that step? Why not go directly to the Bedin? I think in this case, uh, this is a matter of considerable public interest. In all likelihood, the very fact that she has representation would suggest that she's from a wealthier family. She's no, she's no servant girl. She's from a wealthier family. This is now no longer simply a matter of uh, civil uh, restitution of, 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 of the matter from the standpoint of money but may actually, in this case, be more about honor than the previous one. The fact that they go to the community leadership and go into the meeting room, you can imagine that the community board is, is meeting about other things and somebody busts into the room with the, her attorney and says, yeah, this meeting has to stop because uh, a terrible thing has happened and we can't let uh, things go on any longer in this community until such things are resolved. I think that there is a, there's a call it a communal or political or public aspect of this that's perhaps different from the, the, uh, the more private uh, case of the previous, uh, the previous uh, page. And the Kahal essentially punts, and they said, after we heard his words, we invited the dead deed. They decided they couldn't handle it, to join us and deal with the matter according to religious law, and to place a barrier against the licentiousness of the generation so that our daughters are not treated wantonly. I just want to say that it, it, you call it a punt. I might suggest that it's a little different. Okay. In other words, it may be that this is something akin to uh, the joining of the executive and the judicial branches of the government, right, in a common effort to deal with a social problem. That is, uh, the kahal, that's the executive of the leadership of the community, has been. Uh, has encountered the problem. Now what do we do about it? So the Beidin is brought in to help. And presumably the Beidin is brought in to help in this case, but the Kahal would take up the issue of a communal, reg of communal regulations later on to place the barriers. That's against. right. And the fact is that we already have a regulation on the books. There was a, an enactment of communal legislation in 1769 this was going on periodically. Every uh, 20 or so, or 25 years, a new iteration of communal legislation would be published. And in 1769, interestingly, there would be, what, so 15 or so years, right? 15 years before this, there is greater attention given in the, that legislation to problems of sexual promiscuity. And there are enactments there that don't appear any time before about uh, preventing uh, two unmarried, uh, uh, as a man and a woman, unmarried, from being unchaperoned together in the evening because of some of the issues and problems that uh, were being encountered in the community. So the community is already on record as having felt that this was a problem that needed to be Addressed. Now, here we are 15 years later, and basically, Rajla, Bakfisma, and Cohen is saying it's not working. Mm -hmm. So, um, and, and this is really wonderful what follows because it gives us a mirror into, into real dynamics and real sort of social rea realities and, and real human beings and their lives. We sent for Rajla and Hertz to present their claims and responses face to face without legal representation. That is there, I found it really fascinating because she is represented by the attorney and the community is clearly saying, no, 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 we have to get the legal counsel away so we can get to the, to the real story. So like, like in the previous case, let, I'll give you a bottle of wine if you listen to what she's saying. Here it's in a more formal setting, but, but in fact, they are trying to get what they will be saying. Get it, and the truth as unadulterated, excuse the pun, <laughs> as possible. 
So Reifler, uh, that didn't want to Paris to tell the truth. Reifler claimed that she had become pregnant by Hertz and not by anyone else. She also indicated precisely, and the, the words are wonderful, precisely when, the, when intercourse occurred and the number of times which, had, which was recorded in writing. She demanded that he marry her and also demanded that he pay all expenses related to her pregnancy and child support. He responded that her claim were all lies and he never touched her. He admitted that he had entered her house at night on several occasions to drink whiskey in her mother's store as the other men, but he never touched her as is recorded in his deposition. It's a wonderful passage here about uh, about the again, but what it what it raises that the sexual encounters were not the problem. They only became a problem when she became pregnant, right? Because this is happening a number of times. She's indicating precisely when they occurred and how many times occurred. He goes with his bodies and, and boasts of, of his exploits. That he disproved that, that her claim were crimes were true and that therefore the claims against him were in order. We, the Kahal and the Bedin, sent for witnesses and placed them in the presence of hers and we recorded their statements in writing. Now you doubted it out. I wonder whether there are statements in the records or whether there was just Nothing, nothing important was recorded. Okay. <laughs> nothing exciting? I had to get it on three pages. <laughs> After we heard their testimony and read the written records, we, the leaders of the community, in conjunction with the bed team, seeking to pre prevent again the licentiousness of the generation, especially insofar as women are liable for excision, if they violate the laws of Nida, and there, um, there is also the possibility of incest. And they threw everything in here. <laughs> we decided to banish Hertz until he appeases Reifler by marrying her, and if he was required to deposit uh, 1,200 libs um, with the third party until the birth to determine that her statements were accurate. If it was, then the money will be returned over. It will be turned over to Rifle. If not, the money will be returned to him. In any event, he will be required to pay a fine of 300 livres uh, that would be distributed to the poor. Yeah, uh, we we we've seen that in the case of the uh, royal decree, we see the pressure that that French society is having on the Jewish community. Can, can you talk a little bit about the way that these decisions of the Beit Din are being also structured or not structured in some kind of response to French law? Uh, would a woman be accorded the same uh, kind of uh, uh, trial or hearing in a French court at the time? Or would other Jewish courts, let's say in Poland uh, or uh, elsewhere in Eastern Europe uh, deal with women in a comparable way? So I'll start with the French and then I'll... I'll I think you should. Okay. You probably have okay. to tell us more about it. But I'll add a little okay. bit. Okay. So uh, yeah. according to my reading of the uh, most recent uh, scholarship on uh, children out of wedlock and pregnant mothers of France, it appears that the taking up of these issues uh, in the Beit Din is very close to, way, to the way that these proceedings transpired in the French courts. The main difference, however, is this, that ordinarily the putative father, that is the alleged father, would be given the choice, pay or play. Basically, pay uh, the, the expenses of, uh, of uh, medical expenses and, 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 and uh, maintenance, or marry the girl. What we see here is that more often than not, because we don't have all the cases in front of us, uh, the, this alleged father, assuming that he assumes responsibility, is going to be expected to pay and marry her both. So that's, it's interesting that it's similar, but there still is that distinction, I think, that emerges in the way that the, uh, the rabbinic court uh, I think is trying to be as responsible as it can and see to it that uh, 
Both her needs are met, and she's not left as an unwed mother. I, I actually will step to a different question because one in, in uh, certainly in Christian courts, uh, a lot of the unwed mothers questions come up either in terms of honor, which I already mentioned, but uh, more often it ends up in a criminal court because it becomes an infanticide. So I wonder um, whether you've had cases where that borderline on infanticide and what the Jewish community did. I think in Polish, some of the Polish rabbinic uh, records, not rabbinic courts because we don't have them, but responsa, there are questions of dead children and that of course would end up in a criminal court and the Jewish community is trying to prevent that. But I wonder whether you've had any cases related to the other, you know, um, a more painful and difficult question of unwanted children in the pre-modern era where infanticide would have been one of the solutions? I haven't seen anything in these records. Uh, there are, of course, issues that come up in the response of literature, uh, but that's not so much from France as it is from neighboring Germany. And uh, if it's at all relevant, uh, one could mention the uh, famous response of number 31 of Chavot Yair, which is the response of Rabbi Yair Chaim Bachran of Worms, uh, living uh, between 1638 and 1702, where he actually makes a case for the legitimacy, legal legitimacy of, of abortion, uh, that is not as an elective matter, but insisting that it is not a homicide and that there are circumstances where it could be uh, performed. And one wonders whether there may be some link between that and some other things that are going on late in the 17th century. But uh, I'm afraid and, that and I in Germany, that was pretty, uh, the questions on infanticides and tried in, uh, in criminal courts. Probably yes. So uh, unfortunately, we don't have any, or fortunately perhaps, we don't have anything quite like that in the Mets Beijing. Either it was not happening or it was never recorded. Mm -hmm. We don't know. Uh, I don't understand the judgment. Okay, they say they're going to banish him until he marries her. So actually, if he doesn't mind being banished, you know, then that's really not a punishment necessarily. But also, he's supposed to give this money to a third party until the birth, to, 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 and they'll see if her statements are accurate. Well, what's, what statements? Are they further investigating this? What more investigating is going to take place after the birth? I don't, I don't really understand it. Good question. Very good question. Uh, I'm not sure myself. Uh, I, I suppose that these court, these cases are never completely over because there always is the possibility that someone could come forward. And I think that the distinction here that's being drawn is between his taking her as uh, his wife, that is being required to marry her because he is responsible for the child, and uh, uh, other degrees of responsibility. I suppose that once he marries her, it's a it's sort of, it's, it's moved at that point. Yeah, I think they're waiting whether she indeed will give birth, and right, that is, why should he marry her if she ends up not giving birth? Ah. So maybe that's the thing, that there is this injunction to be sure that she gives birth and then, you know, he would have to marry her and be responsible for it, but not force him to marry her before the child is born. So that's what might be, because the way it reads, at least here, uh, he were, was required to, um, we decided to banish her, uh, presumably, Put him under her, right? Yes, is that yes, what it is? Yes. Uh, and though he appeases right but by marrying her, and if he is required, and he, if he is required to pay the deposit of the third party until the birth to determine that her statements were accurate. So that might be, I mean, we don't know how pregnant she is here. The, in, in the first case, we knew that it was either six months pregnant or, or 
four months, uh, here we don't know, so maybe that's the, the case that they're sort of leaving it conditional, and of course uh, the child may not survive either, so. Exactly. Uh, I want to go back to, uh, oh, yes. Yeah, there, are, there are a few words that uh, would be nice to, um, like, put them on this word. The verb is the communal ban. Sometimes it's translated as excommunication, but I don't really like to translate it that way because that implies that uh, what Jewish communities was, were doing were, was identical to what Christian communities, uh, what the church did. But the ban basically involved the banishment of an individual for uh, some heinous crime or some failure to appear before court or, or the like. Now this is a serious matter because uh, I think someone might have said before, well, what difference would that make if someone didn't care much about being banished? But remember, before Jews are citizens, there, isn't, there aren't many places to go. There's, there are no uh, in neutral spaces, no interstices between, for, let's say, French society and Jewish society. They can't become citizens yet. And if they can't be solid, uh, upstanding members of the Jewish community, then then it is a severe punishment. And it, by the way, it would normally be involved for 30 days, during which time I would expect the individual to recant in order to restore his, his, his prior status. I want to uh, go back to uh, Jonathan Brent's question about the, the interaction with laws and how Jewish community action, I think that comes beautifully in the third case. So that allows us to discuss the question of, of uh, Jewish community as part of larger legal uh, legal framework. Oops, was here. Um, and uh, although we will move from the questions of, of unwanted pregnancies to marital property, uh, this uh, this case really illustrates that phenomenon, legal phenomenon. So maybe. Did you have a question? Yes, I did. Uh, you, seem to, you seem to speak about promiscuity as though everything was invented in the 17th century. The Talmud is loaded in Eating, in Rishin, in Yudhuvah, with all these aspects of promiscuity, illegitimate children. And the second question is that the term Pitatars appear in any of these three tractates of the Talmud? I'll let you talk about the Hebrew term, but I wanted to uh, talk about promiscuity. <laughs> so, um, no, I think, I, I don't think either of us would uh, talk about the promiscuity as originating in the 17th century. I think what, what is, um, what is interesting about this case that we were trying to um, discuss is that in general, our modern society has this concept that um, that sexuality and freedom and out of uh, marriage sexual relations are a product of modernity of breaking down the traditional communities, whether it's in a Christian society or in the Jewish society. And what the studies of the so-called pre-modern period suggest, and then we can go as far back as the Talmud, we can go as far back as the Bible probably. Um, then uh, what they suggest is that this was part of normal life and that the image of this traditional community pious, again, whether it's Jewish or Christian, is simply uh, based on ideals and not the real historical sources. And court records, um, Jewish, again, or Christian, uh, illustrate that real life and real, and it, again, it can go back to even further, this, this is just a human human life and human human experience. So that's what we're, what we're bringing up. And I'll, yeah, you I'll, have I'll, a, I'll just add to that, that in the early modern period, what we have is greater a tendency towards regulation and control so that some of the freer behavior in the Middle Ages around sexuality, about uh, uh, Merry making and, and so on and so forth is now going to come under closer scrutiny than ever before. So that as a result, there may be the impression 
that some of these behaviors are unprecedented or that they're worse now than they used to be, when in fact all we're really seeing is that the community is clamping down more than before because the, the issue of order and disorder is really central to our modern sensibilities. And, in, and in, in terms of Catholic society, it is really only under the, after the second uh, half of the 16th century, the Council of Trent, where marriages are enforced as formal ceremonies. And until then, people could get married just simply by having sex in a barn or culture. Uh, or in, I mean, you, I don't know whether you've seen or read the, the camera, and there's this one store where this young, young couple has sex, and the two families want actually them to get married, and they discover them in the bedroom, and they say, oh, now you're married. So essentially, an act of sexual intercourse could be uh, treated as, um, as marriage, and the cases the early cases, in uh, early the 16th century cases that we see in Italy and in other places, usually say, well, but he said that he was going to marry, and the reason why they end up in court is because he says, no, I'm not going to marry you. So the the marriage as a formal uh, ceremony is in effect invented or institutionalized in the 16th century. That's when the Catholic society begin to have. Um, the bans, B A N N S, uh, announcements. You know, does anybody know that this young woman and this man are going to get married in three weeks in this church? Does anybody have anything against it? That begins in the in the 16th century, following the Council of Trent. So this is this formalization. So in, I always tell my students that in effect there were no children out of wedlock, so to speak. I, I you know, oversimplify it until the late 16th century because you could claim that they got married um, through the act of intercourse in the, in the Christian side. So this, this discipline, this sort of um, uh, regulation, it also extends to marriage and, and those boundaries of that. Can we go to the last case? Yes, uh, let's briefly go to the last case. Yeah, otherwise we may not get out of here tonight. Uh, but I have a uh, goal line myself. Uh, okay, number 591. This is on marital property. Do you want to the very last uh, paragraph. On would you uh, would like to begin with this? Uh, sure, okay. just, just maybe summarize it because I don't know whether we have time to fully read yeah. it, but then highlight those yeah. points that are really interesting and important. Yeah, I think, I think a couple of interesting points here. The, the, uh, by the way, the word katsina, or katsin, refers to someone of uh, uh, a higher echelons of the Jewish community. The word katsin in modern Hebrew means an officer. Uh, in this particular instance, I think it simply refers to people of, of affluence. This Nenha uh, is the daughter of the late Abraham Zinsheim, and her son is Hertz Blaine, or Bell. Okay, we know that name. The, the Bell family was a major army purveyor. He was uh, the father of this Hertz uh, Bland was perhaps the wealthiest Jew in France. Okay, it seems that uh, we notice here that there was a marriage contract that had been deposited uh, with a notary. The notary's name is, is mentioned here, Monsieur Lankian of Steinbietersdorf, a village not far from Metz. Uh, and that was in November 1775. And then let me just, uh, you see we're in the middle, there's some Hebrew words, let me explain what those are. One of the copies of the Tanaim Achronim, these are the conditions of marriage. It's a Hebrew word, Latin, and final conditions, uh, really of the sort of the engagement, was placed in his hand, meaning in the hand of the notary, so that in this way her contract, her contract, notice the French word, for her ketuba, a marriage contract, and tosefta, which is an additional sum promised by the husband to the wife, should the marriage dissolve, from the aforementioned, aforementioned date, would have legal validity in the archaot from that day. The word archaot is the word in Hebrew for civil courts, not Jewish courts. Okay, so what we're saying already here is that marriage, Jewish marriage, is a civil act which is recognized in French law. The registration of marriage is, uh, is made with the notary. 
and that registration must be within 15 days following the Jewish wedding. And what that implies, of course, is something very great, which is that marital differences around property could then be litigated, not simply in the Beit Din, but actually in the civil courts. That's a, a rather remarkable phenomenon. So now we're talking about really two courts that have jurisdiction, the French courts and the Jewish courts. And the advantage of the French courts, of course, is that the French courts have the power and the, and the authority to use coercion in order to enforce their decision. The Beit Din does not have that power. So the will of the which is a cherem, which is a banishment, but it's not, it's not quite a physical punishment. So I think that uh, what really stands out here, perhaps more than anything else, is the fact that in this particular instance, the Beit Din is a full partner with the idea that there will be instances where it will defer to the French civil courts in order to achieve justice. The word justice here is really the transcendent word that in some ways really uh, overlays the question of which jurisdiction is most important. Justice can be achieved only in this instance by the court that has the power to enforce its ruling. Uh, I, I would also note that uh, what's brought her to, 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 uh, to the court, to the Beit Din, is that she's been estranged from her husband for 20 years. And as a result of his betrayal, meaning his promiscuity, uh, promiscuity, adulterous affair, uh, she has a marriage contract that's worth 49,000 French livres. Now, I tried to do a little bit of math before I came in to decide, so what would that translate into today's terms? So those of you who have a little bit of math background, work with me for a second. OK, imagine that a typical salary in the Jewish community was about 1,000 livres per year. This is 49 times that. So let's just say for the sake of argument that 1,000 livres is the equivalent of $100,000 sal annual salary for someone today. Then 49,000 livres, or almost 50,000 livres, would be the equivalent in our terms of almost five million dollars. That's quite a marriage contract. She's got a lot to say. She needs to go to the French court. <laughs> she needs a reassurance. <laughs> but um, that's what she would get from him on the eventual divorce. That's what she would she would get if he has liquid assets. But what if she had liquid assets and she wanted to be married? And he would hold her up on that because they have a particular now. Correct. She could be an Aguna. She could be. Yeah. Whereas in the other two cases, there is no mention of a Kajuba. Therefore, there is no question of a woman being an Aguna. There is no question of the children being a there or in that situation. I just threw that out to an answer. <laughs> let, let me just, one, one point I want to clarify. The, the existence or non-existence of Ketuba itself is not going to be the, okay. the matter of determining whether she would or would not be an Aguna. Okay. If she is married by any, any particular way, in other words, assuming that it's a, with witnesses and she's, she's considered to be married, then even if, even if she doesn't have a Ketuba, she could still be held up as an Aguna. In this particular instance, I think, you're, I think you put your finger on something. Uh, she's seeking uh, the resources that will enable her to get the value of her marriage contract, which is the size of the sum of money. However, were she to desire to remarry, that would not be accomplished very easily unless the husband were willing to, uh, to uh, cooperate. And we don't know where he is. Because she, if she married, uh, the children would not be an issue. So the fact that it's 20 years, but she can't remarry. But no one can only marry, marry them. And there's no civil marriage yet in France yeah. at the time. So that's. So one more.
more questions and I'll let you feel that because that's too many of you I don't want to be the judge at the end. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, uh, <laughs> and you see that there's really there's nothing there. He may have been asked for uh, five million years ago. So uh, in, the, in the remainder of the case, the house is worth about twenty-five thousand livres, okay, which is not an insubstantial sum. And there seem to be some other land and property that he might have had. So she wants to get access to that property, which she generally, rightfully, would not have according to Jewish law. And basically, what 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 the bottom line here is: the Bay team is going to follow the French court on this and award her the right to get that property. That in itself is a strong statement, once again, of the affinity of, of the rabbinic court in this case to uh, the, the, the paradigms and the, uh, the structures of, of, the, of the law of the surrounding society. And presumably there will be a deed for the uh, house in the uh, French court. In the French court, yes. 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 No. yes.